Okay, we're going to finish chapter 15 today, and then we will start chapter 16. Everybody knows there will not be any chapter 16 on the exam, right? But we will be covering through chapter 15. I will not be making the midterm deliberately cumulative. The final will be deliberately cumulative, but of course, when you're doing synthesis problems, you need to know all the reactions that we've learned. Okay? All right, questions before we get started? Anybody? All right. Okay, so we left off last time talking about radical substitution of benzylic and allylic um, hydrogens. So allylic and benzylic brominations. And so your book uses two, uh, two reagents for this. They use bromine and light or heat. So bromine and light or heat, bromine and light or heat. And, and what we're going to learn is we certainly learned in chapter 10 that there is a competing reaction for this where we do make a 1,2 dibromo compound. That's a very fast reaction and competing. And uh, what we're going to learn is that in some, in, 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 in chapter 18, we're going to be actually brominating the aromatic ring. And so we want, we want to avoid these products from, these side products from forming, this kind of thing. So although the book is using this in a lot of different places, I want you to use a different reagent, and that is uh, N-bromosuccinimid. The good news for that is that we can have an abbreviation NBS. That is NBS, not NBC. Okay, so NBS and bromosuccinimid is the reagent. So we're going to use NBS and we use a peroxide. So any of those peroxide um, initiators, this is an initiator, uh, light or heat and peroxide. So the NBS is our, is our source of bromine. And peroxide is a radical initiator. And this is the region that I want you to use instead for allylic and benzylic bromination. So here, our product's going to be this only. We're not going to get any side product, no side product. The side product that we would get here would be one, would be um, anti-addition of bromine to the double bond, which is not a radical product pro process. All right, and likewise, when we have the benzylic hydrogens that we can remove, um, we will only get the benzylic hydrogens. So you'll appreciate the second one more when we get into chapter 18. Benzene itself is not going to add bromine without a catalyst, but other, er, other um, rings, other benzene rings with different substituents will add bromine to the ring. And so we don't want these competing reactions to take place. So that's why we're going to use NBS instead. So uh, on test, use NBS, R-O-O-R and heat or light, light or heat, for allylic and benzylic bromination. All right, now the good news is um, we said last time we're not going to know, you don't need to know the mechanism for this reaction. It's a complicated mechanism. It has uh, fish hook arrows and it has double headed arrows. So it gets a little involved and that's not something I want you to take your time to learn. So we're skipping that. Okay, so no, no mechanism for this reaction. All right, we're going to take a brief pause to talk about the stereochemistry and then we're going to talk about 
the third reaction that you need to know from this chapter. So the first reaction, bromine and heat or light to take an alkane and make it into an alkyl halide. Remember you're going to form the most stable um, radical, so you're going to lead, that's going to lead to the more substituted um, alkyl halide and bromine is much better than chlorine for selectivity. The second reaction is allylic and benzylic bromination where we're going to use NBS peroxide and heat or light. Okay, that's num reaction number two. Don't need to know the mechanism for reaction number two and then we're going to do a third reaction from this chapter. But first let's talk about stereochemistry. Because three radicals are planar and sp2 hybridized racemic mixtures are obtained in, in reactions that form a stereocenter and that makes sense because these our S, a radical is sp2 hybridized. So we have a plane, we have a p orbital on the top and on the bottom with a single electron and so things can come in and attack from the top and things can come in and attack from the bottom. We are going to get both. So we want to be able to um, make sure to remember that. All right, so here we have um, a chiral reagent, a chiral reagent. And we're going to form a secondary radical. We can go either here or here. We'll form a secondary radical by loss of a secondary hydrogen. We will not be able to form a radical, a primary radical here. And so then let's look at our intermediate. Let's look at the radical intermediate. We know that that is um, sp2 hybridized. So carbon, the carbon from the radical and the first atom are all in the same plane. So let's mark those. So, so this carbon, this carbon, that hydrogen, and that carbon are all in the same plane. And let's go around and, and do that one also. So these guys are all in the same plane. We have our unhybridized P orbital. I'll change the color so we can see that I probably did not allow enough room unhybridized p orbital that contains a single electron. That's the structure of a radical. And now so the bromine can come in. Oh, this radical is going to grab a bromine from molecular bromine from a BRBR, okay? And if it attacks at the top face, Here's the product that you're going to get. Here's bromine coming in from the top. Remember, once that bromine um, bonds to the carbon, it's now tetrahedral. It's not planar any longer. And if it comes in from the bottom, if the bromine comes in from the bottom, and this is the first time we've used this, this word, but we, it's, it's called the face, bottom face, top face. And if it comes in from the bottom, then this is what the product looks like. And so if we're starting with achiral reagents and there's no chiral influence, then that means that um, if we have a stereocenter in our product, and we do, there's a stereocenter right there, that the, that the mixture must be racemic. So product has stereocenter. Therefore must be racemic. So you, if you were thinking you were going to get away with thinking about stereochemistry, um, we're not done yet, okay? So definitely stereochemistry we have to worry about here. So um, this is a racemic mixture. If we want to get a single enantiomer, we have to have some chiral influence and that's what we saw with the Sharpless epoxidation. There was a chiral catalyst that formed in that reaction and so we could get a single enantiomer. 
But unless we have that, if we don't have that, then we, we're, we're going to get a racemic mixture. So in addition, loss of optical purity will occur if substitution occurs at a chiral center. So just like in Chapter 7, we didn't want to use SN1 if we, did, if we didn't want racemization, same thing here. So if we start with something that's optically pure, we have this chiral center here, optically pure. And generally speaking, making things that are optically pure is a lot more difficult. And if we try to do this reaction with an optically pure, once we do that, let's um, draw our intermediate. We have, again, a planar intermediate, just like with the SN1 reaction. We had a carbocation. This is also a planar intermediate. Only difference here is we have a single electron in that unhybridized p orbital. And so um, their intermediate is achiral. So achiral intermediate. Does not matter that we started off with something that was optically pure, we get racemization. So we get loss of optical purity. And so when we do this reaction, we're going to get two products. Bromine's going to come in from the top and it's going to come in from the bottom. So let's draw both of those. And I'll just abbreviate the, the benzene ring with pH. So here's the product if the bromine comes in from the top. Here's the product if the bromine comes in from the bottom. So here's the bromine coming in from the bottom. That's the enantiomer. So something to keep in mind uh, when we're doing radical reactions. We do uh, want to avoid this reaction if we have a, a chiral center that we're trying to do substitution on. All right, questions on stereochemistry. Anybody? Yes. This is not like that. Yeah, so we're not making a bromonium ion here. So. Oh, when we're talking about a bromonium ion attacking from the bottom face, yeah, we use that same terminology. Yeah, I just haven't used it before. I don't know why I started using it now. It seemed like a good, a good place to start, okay? All right. We said there was three reactions that you will need in synthesis, and this is number three. Radical addition of HBr to an alkene. Now we know what happens when we add HBr to alkene. What type of, of addition is that? Markonikov or anti-Markonikov? Markonikov. So the bromine goes on the most substituted side. So this we already know. Let's draw the product here. So Markonikov product. So this, of course, is chapter 10. Now, if you do the same thing, you take the same alkene, you take HBr, and you add a, a radical initiator. So peroxides are radical initiators. And when I give this reaction on the, and, and, and typically you need either heat or light. Sometimes you don't, but I will usually, just, for, just to make it easier for you, if I'm, if I'm wanting you to do a radical reaction and I'm having you predict the product, I always write H, H nu, okay, so that you'll know it's radical. Uh, but you can certainly also do this with um, heat. But I will always use H nu when I want you to predict a radical product. And so this is the only, the only difference here, I mean, is, is this radical initiator. And what, what, and what you end up getting is anti-Markonikov addition.
So anti Markonikov. Well, that's really useful to be able to have that because sometimes we want anti Markonikov addition. So we have now two reactions that do anti Markonikov. This one, what else? What's the other one? Hydroboration, right? Both of those do anti Markonikov. Hydroboration gives you anti-Markonikov addition of water. This gives you anti-Markonikov addition of HBr. So those are only two. That's all we're going to learn all year. You will need those over and over again in synthesis. So it's, really, it's a really important uh, reaction. So this is um, mechanism type two that might be on the, te the test um, coming up. So we're going to have a radical mechanism on this test. We're also going to have other mechanisms that are not radicals, but the, you have really a choice of two in this chapter. Reaction number two, we're not learning the mechanism. So um, this one is actually, um, so initiation, same idea. When we initiate, we break a weak bond. And our weak bond, we saw a chart with weak bonds in the notes for this chapter, and a weak bond is an oxygen-oxygen bond. So we'll start with... our ra ra radical initiator. And, and that, the, the name of this tells you what's the very first, oh, and I put that in the wrong spot. Let me fix that. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Don't do what I just did. Okay, this is going to be two steps of initiation. So what do you do in the initiation? You break apart the weak bond in the radical initiator. That's going to be the very first step. So that's a, it's an easier way to remember that. So we're breaking this homolytically. One electron goes to oxygen and one electron goes to the other oxygen. So we're breaking that bond and we're going to form two RO minus, or RO, RO dot, two um, alkoxy radicals. Then the alkoxy radical And I'm missing my lone pairs here. So let's go ahead and add those. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually make, we're going to make a bromine radical here. So this um, RO radical is going to grab a hydrogen from HBr. We're going to break this HBr bond, bond homolytically. One electron is going to combine um, in midair with that a rad, the unpaired electron from oxygen. And then we're going to have, um, form a new uh, oxygen-hydrogen bond. And this, this bromine radical, that's the one we're going to use for this reaction. That's the one we're going to start with in the propagation and keep, re, keep reforming. Okay, so that's uh, initiation. When we add a, free, a radical initiator, it's usually going to be two steps. Sometimes it's even more than that, but it, two steps. Why didn't we just break the HBr bond, by the way? Why didn't we just break this bond? Why did we have to add this? Any ideas? What do you think? Well, yeah, go ahead. Exactly. And what is it going to do instead? It's going to reprotonate the it's going to protonate the pi bond. So that those two reasons, yeah, exactly. All right. So um, what this is going to do is the second second type of process we talked about at the very beginning of this chapter. The first one was abstracting an atom from another molecule, and this one is adding into the double bond. So here's our bromine radical that we just made, and it's going to add into the double bond. So we're going to break the double bond homolytically. One electron is going to combine with the bromine. 
just like that. We want to form the most stable radical, so that's why I'm breaking it that way. So I want the radical to go on the secondary carbon, not the primary carbon. And what you want to check for is that all of your propagation steps, we start with one radical and we end with one at radical after each step. If you start with something that's not a radical and you make two radicals, well then it's not a propagation, it's an initiation. If you start with two radicals and you end up with no radical, that's a, that's a termination. So that's what that looks like. And then, um, and this is the, so we're again, and I'm going to redraw this. Now our, now our job here is to regenerate our bromine radical that we started with. So the bromine radical that we use in the propagation is, is really, it's starting with one that came from the initiator, but we don't continue to form the bromine that way. We continue to form the bromine um, in the way that I'm gonna, about to show you right now. So we're going to come and grab hydrogen from HBr. There's the hydrogen right there. We just formed that new bond, CH2Br. And we regenerated our bromine radical. Always want to check for that. That's what we started off with. There it is right there. We regenerate that. And that's one link in the chain and it cycles through one atom, one molecule at a time, boom, just like that. Very surprisingly fast, many of these reactions. Uh, termination radicals destroyed by recombining. You could take any two radicals we have here and recombine them in the, in the termination steps. So I'll let you fill in. On the test, I will ask for one termination. So you can pick whatever one you, what, you, you're going to have your pet termination reaction. Maybe you combine two bromines together, you can do that. All right, questions about that mechanism, anybody? In the propagation step, bromine adds to the sp2 carbon to one butene that's bonded to the greater number of hydrogens to form a secondary radical rather than to form a primary radical. Why? Um, so why no, and you already, we already said why. But let's write, let's fill this in here. Why no? Secondary product. Well, um, if it, we would form secondary product if we formed this radical. And we don't want to form this radical uh, because it's not as stable as a secondary radical. There's a big difference. And so, um, because the transition state leading to the secondary radical. Is lower in energy than the transition state leading to the primary radical. How do we know what the transition state looks like? We use Hammond's postulate. The transition state is going to look like um, the, either the reagent or the product, whatever it's closest in energy to. And since this is an endothermic reaction, it's going to look closest to the product, which is a radical. Okay, so anything that stabilizes the product radical is going to also stabilize the transition state. All right, so an alkyl peroxide in, in is a radical initiator. There's a bunch of different ones. It create, it's because it creates radicals without a peroxide, the preceding reaction would not occur. Radical initiators have weak bonds that readily undergo homolysis. So there's, I'll, I'll give you just a little bit more reactions here. This is uh, 44 kcals per mole. 
you might recognize that reagent as one of the reagents that is used in the Sharpless epoxidation. Okay, so they're, they're guaranteed there's some sort of radical process during that reaction. Why I didn't show you the mechanism. Actually, radicals are reacting in a lot of those reactions from chapter 12, but they're way too complicated for this class. So that's 44. Uh, do, you, do you need to memorize these numbers? No, I'm not big on numbers. Just, just I, what, what I want you to recognize is we've got the two hetero atoms both with lone pairs right next to each other. That's going to make for a weak bond. Um, this is um, benzoyl peroxide, 30 kcals per mole. And this is um, a AIBN, don't have the, um, it's very low also. Don't, I, don't, I, I forgot to look up the number for that. Azobis isobuteronitrile, that's another common uh, initiator. So we call this the peroxide effect. If we, if we don't add peroxide, we get a polar mechanism, we get Markonikov addition. If we add peroxide, we get anti-Markonikov addition and a radical process, not polar. So we call this um, the peroxide effect. And this effect occurs only with HBr, not with HCl or HI. Why? Um, and the reason is, is that if you calculate enthalpy change for each reaction, so for radical addition of HBr, the first propagation step is exothermic. Second propagation step is, step is exothermic. First propagation step for HCl is um, exothermic. Second propagation step is endothermic. And for HI, endothermic first step and exothermic second step. And it turns out that for um, the first propagation step and the second propagation step, if both steps are not exothermic, the reaction doesn't go and you get a polar mechanism instead. So um, only when all of the propagation steps are um, exothermic Can propagation compete with termination? So notice in a termination reaction, we're taking two radicals and we're combining them to make a bond. Is that exothermic or endothermic? We're just making a bond, not breaking any, right? exothermic. So we have this exothermic termination step which is competing for propagation. If, if we have any of these steps are endothermic, it doesn't go. So HBr is the only one you're going to use for this reaction. Okay, so HCl or HI, hydrochloric acid or hydroiodic acid, only ionic addition occurs. to give Markonikov product. Even if you add peroxide, the peroxide is just going to sit there and not, not, not react. Even if you add peroxide. All right. And let's draw a line right here. Midterm two material up through here. The last part of this chapter is a little bit topical. I'm going to go quickly through it. I will not be testing you on it. All right, so midterm two stops right there.
Okay, auto oxidation. Um, so auto oxidation, when, it, when organic compounds are exposed to air, they react slowly with oxygen to give hydroperoxides. This is known as auto oxidation. It's responsible for the slow deterioration of air in foods, rubber, and paints. So some, some paint jobs tend to fade more than others. Red is a big one, blue is a big one. That's all caused by auto oxidation. If you, if you keep rubber outside for a long time, it gets all crackly, right? You know, these things like that, these things break apart. And so compounds that are easily auto-oxidized are compounds that form especially stable radicals. So that's the things we want to look for. So you can imagine, um, if in, in the presence of oxygen, this guy right here can form an especially stable radical, right? Tertiary benzylic radical, what could be better, right? So that's going to be especially prone to um, oxidation. And let me show you what a hydroperoxide looks like. These guys are very reactive and potentially explosive. So we turn this nice benign compound into a peroxide. And peroxides, of course, are um, going to be especially reactive. Compounds with hydrogen atoms on a carbon adjacent to an oxygen are also prone to oxidation. And so you've used di diethyl ether in the lab, right? That ha you have to be really careful with diethyl ether. You have to use it up pretty quickly. And um, if you don't use it up pretty quickly, then you have to, it will, will form peroxides, hydroperoxides. So this is diethyl ether. hydroperoxide. Extremely explosive. Um, um, with, there's been explosions with um, ether that's been left out too long. Um, if you use ether in the lab, you'll usually find it in a metal can with a very, especially anhydrous ether. You'll find it in a metal can with a very small opening in the top. Really small, like, like that. So that not very much air gets in there because we don't want this to happen. Um, but when this has formed and people have not been careful, there's been very serious explosions. Uh, one in particular I heard about where it took, an, it moved an entire wall over six feet. Um, that's what the explosion did. So um, things like that. Um, the other thing that's very prone to oxidation are um, polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats. And um, so this is uh, uh, linoleic acid. Got to be careful with these guys. This is linoleic acid, hydroperoxide. Uh, so not very, not very healthy for you. So let's let's look about what's think of what's happening here. So we've got um, linoleic acid. Which um, hydrogen in that molecule is going to be um, easily form a radical? What would be the most, uh, most stable radical you could form from that molecule? Where would it be? Give me the carbon numbers, starting from, uh, there's too many numbers here. What do you think? This guy right here, right? Allylic on one side, allylic on the other, right? Doubly allylic. Very prone to oxidation, right there. Very, very prone to oxidation. And so um, th that doesn't look like the product that we have. Let me just show you very quickly how you form the linoleic acid hydroperoxide. So what you do is do not need to memorize this. So this is just for your own betterment as a human being and your own safety because you're going to be careful about this kind of stuff. I mean, polyunsaturated fats are really good for you, um, but you need to keep, make sure that you don't keep them too long. So let's, we're going we're gonna to ab abstract that hydrogen. That's what we would get. And one thing you want to keep in mind, this is, this, when you form an allylic radical, you have to draw the resonance structure. And this is not just in this last part of this chapter. This is when you're doing allylic bromination, make sure you draw the resonance structure and you will get products from both resonance structures. So we know that allylic radicals are resonance stabilized. We're going to see that at the beginning of chapter 16 also. Um, 
and there was something in lab last week where we did that and we'll do that again this week. And so what I'm, I'm just going to go like this and I'm just going to do resonant stabilization. I didn't show you the arrow pushing for this, but we did talk about this at the very beginning of this chapter. And then uh, what that does is now gives you this radical. What's good about that, what we just did? Why does that make that radical more stable? So we're, we're actually in this resonant structure, we're making that radical more stable. Why is that? That double bond and that double bond are now conjugated. Okay, remember conjugation adds stability. We're going to talk about um, that more in chapter 16, which we're going to start in a minute here, but um, this is now conjugated. So it's not only allylic, but it's conjugated. These double bonds are conjugated. So this is uh, now um, allylic plus conjugated. And so that is going to, and, and so what's going to happen is that um, the oxygen um, in the air, oxygen in the air is a diradical. It's going to come and go here, just like that, right? And then we get this. And that's going to grab a hydrogen from another molecule. Uh, let me change the color here so you can see that a little better. It's going to grab a, a hydrogen from another molecule of RH, which is another molecule of the linoleic acid. And so um, what, that's one of the reasons why uh, manufacturers um, like to add saturated fats or hydrogenate fats, partially hydrogenate fats and hydrogenate fats, um, because if you do that, you get rid of this guy right here. They're more shelf stable. You don't have to keep them refrigerated. Uh, of course, the, the, the polyunsaturated fats are, are definitely much better for you. And so one of the things, that, the other things that manufacturers do is add um, antioxidants. So you may maybe recognize some of these, BHT, BHA, these are added. And, and the reason that we use these is that this one, for example, um, forms a really stable radical. So it removes the radicals that start to form to keep the food safe. And this particular one is very stable because it's so hindered. If we, if we actually drew out all those terpetal groups, you would see. This is a uh, hindered phenoxy radical. So it traps any radicals that are formed and that's why we add those as antioxidants. Okay, questions on chapter 15, anybody? Yeah, let me just start to save this and go ahead. Say that one more time a little louder. For this one here, um, not, well, that's the part of the test. Yes, if, you, if, you're, if you're making a resonance structure in the earlier part of the chapter that's going to be tested on, you would want to draw a resonance arrow. Yes. All right, let's do chapter 16. Oh, where is chapter 16? Oh, scared me for a minute there. Okay. All right. Now the first, the first part of chapter 16, you're going to say, oh, we already know that. We've already talked about that. So, so some of the first part of this chapter, especially if you had my class before where I talk about conjugation, this is actually the first place that uh, Smith talks about con uh, conjugation. And so there's actually some chapters in the end, some problems in the end of this chapter that have you just drawing resonance structures like we did back in chapter one. Okay, so it seems in some ways a little late to do it. That's why I introduced it a little bit earlier. So this is all about conjugation, resonance, and dyings. 
So conjugation occurs whenever p orbitals can overlap on three or more adjacent atoms. Okay, so um, we say that we know that, oh, that's too big here. Let's fix that. We know that conjugation makes things more stable, but why? And that's because there's resonance stabilization. So although this is a minor resonance structure, we are um, actually moving electrons around to help stabilize this molecule. So one end gets the negative charge and one end gets the positive charge. We ran across conjugated carbonyls when we did the IR chapter. And so that, that would look something like this. We can move electrons this way onto oxygen. We're moving onto oxygen. We're moving in that direction because oxygen's more electronegative than the carbon that's at the other end. So um, that's why we're doing that this way. And this is going to be important when we get into um, 51C. We talk about carbonyl chemistry. We also know about allylic carbocations. Those are resonance stabilized. Oops, did that wrong. So there's a resonance stable allylic carbocation. We also know that allylic radicals, which I just mentioned, are also resonance stabilized. Weird looking arrow pushing, but that's exactly what you would get. So you, would, you need to be on the lookout for these. You need to be on the lookout for allylic carbocations, allylic radicals, and just remember that you need to draw the resonance structure. And um, allylic carbanions also, although we're going to move, we're going to move um, electrons in a different direction here. All right, so when it turns out that these conjugated systems are more stable than non-conjugated, as we've talked about already, when p orbitals overlap, the electron density in each of the pi bonds is spread over a larger volume. This lowers the energy and stabilizes the molecule. So if you look at what this one looks like, these two resonance structures here, if we had to draw all the p orbitals, this is what they look like. In order for this molecule to be conjugated, those p orbitals all have to be adjacent to each other, parallel to each other. If they're not parallel to each other, then they can't overlap properly. So this is what it would look like. So they're all straight up and down parallel. If you tilt one like this, you're not going to get conjugation. And we, we can say the same thing for all of these. Let's jump over to this last one here. And that's going to change things a little bit, the way, the way that we learn things. Let's draw the hybrid for this last one. Where? Oh, yeah. I'm missing that. Let's throw that in there. Yeah. Okay, so the hybrid, right? We know how to draw hybrids. It turns out that this is what it looks like. We have overlap all the way across. We have partial negative charge on the left, partial negative charge on the right. That would be our hybrid. All right, so now, um, now, we're gonna tell you, now we're gonna tell you that we lied to you in chapter one a little bit. We told you a little falsehood in chapter one. All right, so let's, let's look at this. If you were in chapter one, what would the hybridization of this carbon be? With sp3. But now look at that resonance structure right there. What's the hybridization of that carbon now in, in that resonance structure? sp2. And um, so it's not, that, that's not sp3, it's sp2. Okay, so all of the atoms across here are sp2 hybridized. They all have to be sp2 hybridized in order for these um, electrons to overlap. And they all have to be parallel to each other in order for those electrons to overlap. So this is going to look like this. Overlap all the way across, just like that. 
if this, if, if something was going on in this molecule and this carbon right here, um, what's going to happen is, is this is going to become sp2 hybridized and if this was not in a position, if this was in a position where this p orbital was not parallel with those, then they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't be conjugated. Have to be parallel to be conjugated. All right, so when the p orbitals overlap, the electron density of each of the pi bonds is spread over a larger volume to a delocalized non-bonded electrons or electrons in pi bonds. There must be p orbitals that can overlap and that means that they're going to have to be parallel. This also means that the hybridization of an atom is different than would have been predicted using the rules outlined in chapter one as we've just demonstrated. Conjugated systems must be planar to allow overlap of p orbitals. All right, so here we have, um, this is benzene and we have three different drawings of benzene here. This is the p orbitals. Notice they're all parallel to each other. So we get overlap on the top, we get overlap on the bottom and it looks like this. Okay, so definitely all of those, are, that's all those um, double bonds there are conjugated. And so the ring is planar. This allows for continuous overlap. of adjacent p orbitals. All right, it's so, so now if we make this ring two carbons larger, so this is a six membered ring, this is an eight membered ring, it seems like this would be the same as that, right? But the problem is when you get to these larger rings, the um, bond angles change and this a molecule here is not planar. And so what that means is that um, these double bonds are not conjugated in this ring. There is no conjugation with these double bonds. These are all conjugated, this is not. And that's because the p orbitals um, can't be parallel to each other. So we've drawn in two of them. So here's the, on the bottom here, that would be, there's a double bond there, so there's overlap here. And then we moved over to this double bond, so that would be there, and notice they're perpendicular. There's no sideways overlap. Those double bonds are not conjugated. So each double bond is uh, what we call isolated. So this adopts a tub shape. Tub shaped ring to minimize ring strain. Therefore, the double bonds are not conjugated. So we would actually call them um, isolated double bonds. What did I do here? <laughs> okay, going a, little, going a little nuts here. Conjugated, I can spell conjugated. Therefore, double bonds are not conjugated. Now, uh, kind, of, kind of difficult to picture ring strain here. Um, I have these atoms, I have these molecular models in my office and you're welcome to come by and take a look at them. And if I, and if I remember, if I remember, if somebody reminds me, I'll bring them on Monday. We have two more minutes, so let's talk about relative stabilities of conjugated dienes. A little bit. All right, so we would call these, double, these two double bonds, they're not conjugated. So we would call them isolated. These double bonds are conjugated. Remember, we alternate double, single, double, single for conjugation. These are conjugated. We know it's more stable when they're conjugated because of resonance, but how much more stable? So one of the ways we can uh, figure this out is we can hydrogenate with a catalyst and um, both go to the same compound. So just like we did with alkenes, 
If they both go to the same compound, which the, both of the products have the same stability, then that means it allows us to estimate. So we have delta H naught. Um, for the isolated, is minus 61 kcals per mole. For the conjugated, it's minus 54. And so what that means is that we have increasing energy going this way. This is the energy of the alkene, alkyne. And then the, the, the isolated is here. It releases 61 kcals per mole. The conjugated only releases 54. So that means it has to start off at a lower energy. Here's 54 kcals per mole. So it's lower in energy than the isolated diene because it releases less energy when um, hydrogenated. We'll stop right there and we will continue this on Wednesday.